Guten Morgen. <laughs> Let's pray. Oh, Lord in heaven, holy is your precious name. Like we just sang in song, Lord, and praised your name. And you understand that to be a sacrifice of praise. Wow. We're offering to you our praises in song and psalm and hymns and, and, uh, and prayers. Remembering and continually keeping before us all you've done for us, Lord. You've given us your truth in word form. You've given us your truth in flesh form. And that truth combated the lie and was victorious on the cross. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that you exist all by yourself and that any lie has to have you to pervert to even exist. And thank you that you've given us the knowledge between the two, the difference between the two. And that we'll never come off of that, that we'll know what spirits we're dealing with. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Be with the persecuted church as always. Protect them, Lord. Allow them whatever you have for each individual as you're testing all of us in some form or fashion. And faith is the bottom line. So thank you for that, Lord. Let the, print, or let the, yeah, let the Prince of, of Peace bring the peace of Jerusalem, Lord. And let it be as quickly as, as you have it already figured out. You have appointed a day on which your wrath will judge the world. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, if I were to put a title to my message today, it would be something like, Love the Lord and follow His commandments, and you can't serve two masters, or because you can't serve two masters. Uh, go with me to the book of Joshua, please. You know, this subject we've covered a lot because it's a, it's, it's a main subject. In fact, it's... It's the way it is in, in, in the Bible from beginning to end, really. At chapter 23 of Joshua. And I want to point out a few things. We'll skip around a couple of other verses here and there. And just to point, bring the point home. And please understand these points when I say bring the point home. is not that you haven't heard it. It's not that it's not residing with you. It, like, so it's not like it's not at home. But we have to continually be reminded of the word of the Lord. Do we understand that? We have to continue, continually be reminded because the world and the flesh and Satan, are three enemies, are very, very powerful, very, very sneaky, very, very persistent. And if we don't keep persistence in having our relationship with the Lord as close as possible, then we're going to have a separation. There is no middle ground. There is no fence. You know, if you're not going upstream, you're going downstream. There's no such thing as sitting in a stream. It goes one way or the other. So 23, 1 and following. Now it came to pass a long time after the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua was old, advanced in age. <coughs> Excuse me. And Joshua called for all Israel for their elders, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers, and said to them, I am old, advanced in age. You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has fought for you. It was the Israeli individuals who were in the battle or on the battlefield, swinging the sword and what have you, but it was God who was fighting. Victory was assured because of the Lord. Okay? Verse 4 See, I have decided to, uh, to you, has, uh, sorry, see, I have divided to you by lot these nations and remain <coughs> to be an inheritance for your tribes from the Jordan with all the no nations that I have cut off as far as the great sea westward. It's talking about the Mediterranean. And the Lord your God will expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight, so you shall possess their land as the Lord your God promised you. See, it's God's land to begin with. And when God wants to give it to somebody, he does so as he wills. Okay, and this was promised to Abraham, Isaac, 
and Jacob. Verse 6, listen to this. Therefore, be very courageous. To what? To keep and to do. To keep and to do. To keep and to do. I could make a rap song out of that. To keep and to do. All that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. Either way you go, when you get away from God's directives, it's not going to be good. And lest you go among these nations, these who remain among you, you shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them, nor bow down to them. And bow down in the Hebrew always means to serve and to worship. To do this before another God tells God you're worshiping them. Go with me to 1 John. We'll go there another time after this, but go with me to 1 John chapter 2. Are you with me? 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, 4, and 5. Now by this we know that we know Him. You know, a lot of people claiming to know God. And how do we know Him? If we keep His commandments. That is, obey them. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But, what, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Today, back then, it was the law of Moses, all 613. Today, it is love God and love your neighbor. Jesus distilled all those laws down to those two, didn't he? So what's he say? If you don't do this, you're going to be watered down. You're going to go to the other gods. You're going to do and adopt that which is all around you, which is a lie. Okay? The world we see around us, the world systems, are a lie. Verse 8, But you shall hold fast to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations, but as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. If you remember, Joshua took over from Moses. Moses couldn't go into the, into the promised land, but Joshua did. He was the leader of Israel and a great warrior at that, and he took them over. And yet they did not totally do what God commanded them. They did not totally destroy all the nations. There were some still left in there. And it was about a 20-year process. It wasn't like one war or one fight that lasted a few hours or a day or a week or a month. It was a 20-year process of fighting and taking over these various nations, okay? And Joshua was already around 80 or so, by the way, when, when, he got the, when he took over from Noah, I mean from Noah, from Moses. That would really be, he would really be old if he took care from Noah. <laughs> <coughs> So look at 11. Therefore, take careful heed to yourselves that you, what? Love the Lord your God. Go with me to the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Johann. The Gospel of, Gospel of John, chapter 14. What I want to drive home to you again as it is always good when I had it driven home to me again, is what does it mean to love God? Verse 11 of Joshua 23 says, Take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God. What does that mean? 14, verse 15, Jesus is speaking he says, if you love me, stroke my head. No, that's not what it says. If you love me, do as many outreaches as you possibly can. No, he didn't say that. Mm -hmm. If you love me, go to church regularly. No. If you love me, brush your teeth twice a day. See, all those things are good, and we should do them. But if you love me, keep my commandments. And what are they? Love God with everything you got, everything that's you, and love your neighbor as you love yourself, because you already love yourself pretty good. That's why we spend time in front of a mirror. Isn't that right? 
Now go to verse uh, 21. Same chapter of John. He who has my commandments and what? Keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. They're going to know Jesus. Can this scripture also mean that if you don't love him, he'll be loved? I don't think so. It's very clear. He who has my commandments and keeps them and keeps them and keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. Wow. Uh, let's look up a few more. Let's go to chapter 15, right next door. Verses 9. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide or stay in my love. Look at 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have what kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. The only reason uh, the Father loved the Son continually was because the Son obeyed the Father. He, Jesus Himself said so right here. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love, or you could put in, therefore, abide in His love. Mm. 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7. It's a long chapter. 7 verse 19. Or wait. I'm in Acts. That's not right. First I got to get to Corinthians. 7, 19. Still a long chapter. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. In other words, the, the written law and all those physical things we do, you know, putting the animal on the cross and burning it up or blaining and draining the blood, any of those things are really nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. This is Paul. So we have the old testament agreeing with the new don't we because we understand that the new testament is an explanation of the old testament or what we call the old testament go to first timothy chapter six. First timothy chapter six Verse 14, that if you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. And if you read before and after that, giving a good witness. The point is we have commandments to keep, don't we? Well, this is not the law of Moses. I know that. But we still have commandments to keep. That's got nothing to do with the law of Moses because they've been fulfilled by Christ. These commandments together are called the law of Christ. Not the law of Moses. Go back to 1 John. 1 John. We just read it. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Wow, that's heavy stuff. It's about the commandments and about keeping the commandments. Therefore, back to Joshua 23:11. Therefore, take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God. Because here's the other side of that. Or else, if indeed you do go back, slide back, forget God, and cling to the remnant of these nations, the remnant, see, they didn't clean them out. This problem of going back to the nations and what they were doing 
in their paganism would not have been as big of a problem had they been cleared out of the land. What happens if you find mold in your house or on a bowl or someplace and you only clean some of it off? Yeah, you're probably going to make the situation worse. You're going to agitate things and it's going to grow like crazy and you're never going to, ever going to get rid of it. You're always going to be tied to the mold, aren't you? In some cases, it, all you can do to get rid of some of these things is to burn it. They've burned whole houses down, million dollar houses down because mold caught on and they couldn't, and it was so much that they, even if we clean it up, even if we used a gazillion gallons of bleach, which is what kills it, straight, no, no mixture, no dilution, it wouldn't help because the mold is in all you know, crevices and little cracks and we can't even get to it. So there'll always be mold, therefore, burn it down. Wow. Now I will tell you that they've taken that truth and really gone crazy with it. Where somebody sees a little mold, they went, oh, you know, I have a mold in my house. I sleep just fine. Clean up what I know to clean up, I'm okay. But there are cases. There are cases where it's so bad that you've got to just get rid of it. Everybody get my meaning? You don't get crazy with it. It's too silly. What you can't reach, you can't reach. How many can burn the house down right now that you live in just to get rid of mold? I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? This has to be done with common sense. But again, look what he's saying. Or else if indeed you go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, and they shouldn't have in the first place, but they are, and make marriages with them or go into them and they to you. In other words, have children. Know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you. Why? You're mixing with them. By, uh, but they shall be snares and traps to you and scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. And they perish for 2,000 plus years. Already they didn't have the land when Israel split up into the northern and southern kingdom. Already there were issues. They were no longer a nation. And then miraculously, as far as you and I are concerned, became a nation in 1948. It's very, very significant to us today because of prophetic insight that the Lord has given us in His Word. Verse 14, Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and I know in all your hearts and in all your souls, and not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. In other words, God's done everything He promised. What's your problem? Stay right. All have come to pass for you, not one word of them has failed. Therefore it shall come to pass that all the good things that have come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so the Lord will bring upon you all harmful things, until he has destroyed you from this good land which is the Lord your God has, which the Lord your God has given you. When you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods and bowed down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and you shall perish quickly from the good land which he has given you. Make no mistake about it when you Start saying, God, talk to the hand because you got something better to do. Or even if you don't realize you're doing it, even, even if there's a, a, you know, a, a good deed inside, a wrapped up in a good deed and whatever it is. We talked in Bible study about Ephesus has lost their first love in the book of Revelation. And we talked about love and, and, and uh, nine or ten major things that happen, uh, or the signs that happen when you lose your first love. First love is like a spousal love. First love is a love that you can't wait to get home to spend time with your babe or your guy or whatever, okay? Uh, and, and while, even though time is gone, Jill and I will celebrate 30 years this coming April. And just on the way over here, she says to me, I want to go on a trip with you. <laughs> <laughs> One reason is we need to get out of town. We haven't for a long time. I mean, a real just, just us for no other reason. You know what I mean? Just, just, just to relax. No, no, no nothing. No, nothing to do, nothing to work. No, what do you call it? Um, uh, scheduled to keep. Nobody, you know, just, just to get out and go. <laughs> just to have a good time and do nothing. Anyway. But the point is, if she didn't have me, she wouldn't have fun, and vice versa. That's, that's a fact. 
There's no need for me to go see the most beautiful place in the world if Jill ain't with me. I'm not kidding. Oh, I can enjoy the beauty, but for about that long. So you need something to share it with. And this is one reason why God created man, to share himself with us. Wow. And he has everything. Nothing is impossible with him, and everything is possible. And we got to quit thinking of this earth as, wow, this is it, or, you know, all this garbage that we were surrounded by. And even this beautiful creation has been perverted. You know, the air is perverted, the water is perverted. Everything's perverted. And we have to chemicalize everything just, just to make it tolerable to our bodies. And at the same time, they claim things like, oh, we're living longer now, you know, because of medicine, blah, blah, blah. Well, medicine is one thing, drugs is another. Never confuse the two. Medicine is one thing, drugs is another. Okay? And this is what we have today, of course. Chapter 24, it's the last chapter in the book. Are you hearing me? Follow his commandments. So then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. Again, the leadership is called along with the people, but especially the leadership. And Joshua said to all these people, the Lord, uh, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Remember when Abraham was called, his name was Abram. He wasn't yet the father of many nations, which Abraham means. He was just Abram, and he was, uh, he was worshiping, you know, pagan gods, just like his, his whole family did. That's how he grew up. So there's a reminder of this. Verse 3, Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants, and gave him Isaac, or gave him Israel. Isaac became Israel. I'm sorry, Jacob. Jacob became Israel. So Isaac is the father of Jacob. If I got that, I misspoke. To Isaac I gave Jacob, there you go, and Esau. To Esau I gave the mountains of Seir to possess, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. That was also not the commandment of God. He said, don't go there. He did anyway. Also I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to what I did among them. Afterward I brought you out, talking about the Exodus. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, <clears throat> and you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. So they cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, brought the sea upon them, and covered them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. Then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time. Notice that in this discourse, from verse 1 all the way through here, there's a certain amount where you say, Then I, Joshua is talking, but he's talking in terms of the Lord. The Lord's using his mouth. He said, And I, you know, verse 5, uh, from verse 3 on, it's the Lord himself speaking to these guys. Verse 8, and I brought you, it was still here, and I brought you into the land of the Amorites who dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. This is not necessarily speaking of uh, uh, Joshua, although he was leader then when they came across the Jordan to take the land. But it was God who did it because it was God who fought the fight. It was God who gave him the victory, you see. The Amorites, and they fought with you, but I gave them into your hand. So it doesn't depend on how good you fight? Almost. Because if you don't fight, God can't give it into your hand. Please understand, if you're in a fight, if you decide to fight, even today, to save your life or somebody else or whatever may happen, if you decide to fight, you must also at that moment decide to win. I mean, who decides to fight and think they're going to lose? You see? You decide to win. And when you decide to win, God will give you the victory. Hallelujah. Providing, of course, it's a, it's a just thing. But I gave them into your hand, and you might possess their land, and I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose to make war against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore, he continued to bless you. So I delivered you out of his hand. 
See, he's given them everything Joshua said before in chapter 23. Look at all that God has done for you, and he didn't fail in even one thing. And so now this whole thing is being recounted again. Why? They needed the memorization. They needed to be reminded. Then he went over to the Jordan, verse 11, and came to Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you. Also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. But I delivered you into, or I delivered them into your hand. They defeated all them. I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you. Swarms of bugs just on these guys. They couldn't even see. Also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. I have given you a land for which you did not labor. This was already ready to go. The fields were ready to be harvested. Everything was ready to go. Look what God did for them. Wow. He didn't say, go bust rocks and, you know, after, after a season, you know, something might grow. <laughs> if you work really hard and water it really good. <laughs> this was already said. Somebody else did all this labor. That's God's point. And the cities which you did not build... And you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. He gave them all the spoil of the land, in other words. Verse 14. Now, therefore, because all this we just read that God did from you, you know, gave you all this stuff, brought you out of Egypt and all of that and, and into this land of milk and honey, that's why it's called that. If you remember the account earlier in Joshua, they came, the, the spies came back and they had grapes as big as footballs. It was huge. They had huge. This was wonderful stuff. This wasn't some sad, you know, crop that they were going into. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves. Notice how it's a private thing. And this is under the law of Moses. It's still a private thing, isn't it? So fear for your uh, fear. Therefore fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. Really what he's saying is put away self, because even if somebody prays to a little god or a tree or a rock or something, it's self. Because the very first lie says you can be just like God. And if it seems evil to you, verse 15, to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, in other words, the pagan gods that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And, you know, there are plaques being sold by the millions in all so-called Christian bookstores, you know. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, this is where it comes from. This is the scripture. But are they serving the Lord? I pray for the, all those who have that are really serving the Lord. Verse 16, So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is He who brought us out of fathers out of the land of Egypt, uh, from the house of bondage, who did these great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwelt in the land. We also will serve the Lord, for He is our God. See, they didn't get it yet. They recounted it correctly, and they were even sincere. But look what Joshua had to tell them in verse 19. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not Forgive your transgressions nor your sins. Wow, that goes against today's teachings. Well, that God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And here's why you won't, if you won't. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then He will turn and do, and do you harm and consume you after He has done good to you. It's a test, folks. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. So Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord for yourselves to serve Him. So you've made your decision. And they said, we are witnesses. That's it. They put a stamp on it. Like, amen. That's right. That's right, Joshua. And then he says this. Now, therefore, he said, 
put away the foreign gods which are, present tense, which are among you, and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. Joshua knew that there was evil in the camp. There were devil worshipers in the camp. There were pagan worshipers in the camp. And they had to go. Oh yeah, we're going to serve God, you know, even though we got this guy over here and Astra Poles over here and your little Buddhas over here and Statue of Muhammad or whatever over here and pictures of whatever. He said, no, get rid of it. As a nation, individually for certain, but as a nation. So these things are among you. Joshua knew there were people with little gods under their blankets and stuff. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God will serve, or the Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. In other words, he made a law for them. Then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, or what we call the Bible, right? And he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to the people, look how far. First he says, okay, you've got to do all this stuff. God, look what God did. Da, 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 da. Now, for you to keep God blessing you, you got to give your hearts to him. You can't be going to other, other gods. And they said, that's what we'll do. He responds and says, yeah, but you've got to get rid of the pagan gods that are already among you. To you and I, we've got to get rid of our selfishness that's already in us. We've got to get rid of whatever else we hold before God because the first commandment is love God with all your strength, might, soul, everything that's you. Love God. And if we do that, love your neighbor as you love yourselves. That'll be a cinch. That'll be nothing. And this is why intelligent love is really not that hard to, to do and have when we love God first. It doesn't mean be a doormat. doesn't mean be stupid. doesn't mean don't defend yourself against criminal activity. But it does mean know what you're doing, know what's going on around you, you see, and respond accordingly. And so they said all this. So now he says, okay, you said it, and now you're a witness against yourself. You just said it, therefore you're guilty. So if you ever lead someone to the Lord, in time, and I know some of you already have, but I'm in the, when you lead someone to the Lord or, or at that time, you can say to them, you're a witness against yourself. You just said you love the Lord and you believe the gospel. Therefore, by the gospel and according to your words, not mine, your words, your confession, I can say you are justified under God. However, understand that you are a witness against yourself. For if I'm wrong in what I think your, your, uh, your heart is right now, and you're not really saved, you're playing the game, <laughs> then it's on you. It's on you. Because you're the one who said it, you're the one who admits it, you're the one who wants to have it. If I get this, this is what Joshua's doing. He's getting himself out of this. He said, for, for me and my house, I'm serving the Lord. Now you guys, here's the deal. That's what he's doing. He's separating himself from those who may be phonies. And then he goes one step further. He puts a memorial before them with this stone that we're reading about. 27, And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness to us, for it has heard. The stone has heard all the <coughs> All the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your God. Wow. Look at all the chances that we have to deny God, and Joshua didn't, didn't shrink from that. Like people today, you know, once you're in, you're in. You can't deny God, and if you're really, all this nonsense. Yes, we can. The Bible is full of it. Old Testament, New Testament. We're being taught a bunch of nonsense. Go with me to Luke 19.40, concerning the stones. Luke 19.40. Lucas. Wait a minute, was that wrong? Yeah, Luke 19.40. Jesus answered. Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. You know, because they, they, uh, 
they watched them do like they ate without washing their hands and you know, they didn't follow the law of Moses and everything. And Jesus, but he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, if they're not going to witness about me and what they know about the salvation that I'm bringing, the stones would immediately cry out. Don't think that a rock can't know something. Now, I know this is metaphorical. But the earth is alive. Do you understand? It's a different life. Plant life is different from human life. When a plant gets cut and we see some clear liquid coming out of the stem or a leaf or something, we don't call it blood. Okay? Paul even says there's all kinds of different flesh. Fish have a different flesh from animals. Animals have a different flesh from humanity. We're completely different. Also, the heavenlies are a different glory, Paul says. It's a beautiful thing to look up and see the stars and the moon and the sun and all of that. That's a beauty. But that's just beauty for that. There's other beauty for other things, you see. And we sometimes lump these things together, just like we want to lump you know, a false idea of love together. We want to lump a false idea of righteousness together. You know, a false idea of grace together. Wow. Let's understand this. Obedience to God and His commandments is number one. And our commandments are love God with everything we are and have and love our neighbor like we love ourselves. Okay? Okay. So Joshua said, let these stones be a witness. Go back to Joshua, please. So now he's done. He's recounted. He's called them. He's had them confess to them, to their, what they're going to do. He warned them again, and then he gave them a seal or a sign. Okay? All these steps to make it. I mean, there's no way they can get out of this. That's why it's so nonsensical. Oh, just... Just repeat this prayer and you're saved, you're saved, you're saved forever, you're saved, and you can't lose it. What is that? Where's the test? You know, where's that stone? Where's that self witness? Wow. That's what we have to find out. That's what we have to bring people. Because God doesn't want believers, there's a gazillion of them. What He wants is disciples, He wants disciplined ones that are disciplined enough to follow His commandments, which is to love Him with all we got and to love our neighbor like we love ourselves. Will we falter in that? Of course, He knows that. That's why 1 John 1, 9 says, when you sin, just confess it. Confess it, get it over with, because see, the price for sin has been paid. But you can't have that payment wipe out your sin until you repent. Otherwise, everyone in the world is saved, which is what some people teach, called universalism. Because Christ paid for the sins of the world, everyone's sins are paid. That's what they say. And these are scholars who say this. They're not stupid people, but they're ignorant of God's word. They don't know God. They are liars. Repentance comes before salvation. And then the knowledge of God really sinks in after salvation because now you're going to dog it down. Now you're going to read the scriptures. Now you're going to come to church regularly. Now you're going to, you know. And in those things you love God. And when you see somebody in trouble, you do what you can to help them. So the question is, well, people who don't know anything about God help other people. That's true. But they're only doing a godly thing. But they're doing it for selfish reasons, even if they don't know it. Even if they give of their time and money and everything. See, there's always a main reason behind just about everything. And that main reason has to be the Lord God himself. So if someone doesn't acknowledge the Lord God, says there is no God kind of thing, and does these things, they're not even a credit to him. They're only a credit to his own mind and maybe somebody around them who also don't believe God. This is why we have heroes, sports heroes, Hollywood heroes. None of that means a thing. Walking a red carpet down Hollywood with all the other homo, weirdo, God only knows what else, 
godless twits. Are you kidding me? That's a red carpet. That's supposed to be something. And the beauty that they proclaim. Have you ever seen any of them get up in the morning? They look just like you do. You see? Just like you do. And it's all a facade. It's all nothing. It's all stupid. Beauty is only skin deep, isn't it? As far as the world's concerned. But godly beauty comes from the inside. This is why especially women who adorn themselves more so than, than men, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. God never says don't adorn yourself. He says let, let the inner self, your inner beauty, be the real adornment. That's what he says. Okay, So you can do your hair up. You can wear a nice brooch or whatever, you know. Now then you have people who have a thousand rings on and, you know, <laughs> and all this kind of stuff. And then you have people like Mr. T who wears all that to, to bring attention to himself. And, and, it, and, and, uh, and, and it gives a message to some people that's confusing then. After you read, let your inner beauty be the adorning, not the making of hair, not the wearing of jewelry, none of that. Let it be your inner beauty. And then you see a guy like that who claims to be a Christian and do all this stuff. You see, it, isn't there a contradiction? Well, yeah, I'm not saying the guy's not saved. I don't know him. And I know it was just a personification, you know, for the world out there. But we have to consider these things as far as we, as far as us ourselves go, you know, our personality goes, okay? So what's the inner beauty? Your love for God and your love for your neighbor. That's the inner beauty, okay? Right. Hallelujah. And we're all beautiful. <laughs> Especially me. Now this is on film, so there's a witness against myself. <laughs> I told you I was the king of fun last time. Jesus is the king of peace, hallelujah, I'm the king of fun. But actually he's the king of fun too. Verse 28, so Joshua let the people depart. He didn't just say, repeat a little prayer. He didn't just say, you know, remember that? Remember when God took everybody? You know what our forefathers said, blah, 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 blah. Okay, you're fine. He didn't do that. He went through everything, da 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 Because God is a God of order. And when someone wants to deny God to his face, he'll never be able to. Why? Because it's laid out, da 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 And you said yes to that. Therefore, you're a witness against yourself. You, you, know, you said yes to that. And if you don't make it, and you want to complain about it, check your own heart. That's what it amounts to. The beautiful thing about this last chapter is, uh, let's go 29, and then we'll get into the three. Now it came to pass that after these, after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old, and they buried him within the border of his inheritance at Timnath Sirah, which is in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount Gosh. And here's the beautiful thing. Israel, as a nation now, served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua. So they did keep their word. But that was rare because the majority, the vast majority of Israel's kings, both north and south, Judah and Israel, were evil. Only a very few good ones. Same thing in the world. Maybe two or three or four good leaders. The rest are evil folks. Evil, whether they know it or not. So they served the Lord the days of outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord which, had done, which he had done for Israel. And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel had brought up out of Egypt, they buried at Shechem. And they were probably already buried, and this is a recounting, uh, in the plot of ground which Jacob had bought for the sons of Homer, the father of Shechem, for 100 uh, pieces of silver. Here again, silver and gold is real money had become an inheritance to the children of Joseph. And Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him in a hill belonging to Phinehas, his son, which was given to him in the mountains of Ephraim. Here you have some more uh, rundown here. You know, today, the state is the most important thing the state tells us. Remember, the state is the might instrument of the ruling class. The state is the might. Oh, it's about national security. Wait a minute, I thought it was about my security. They want you and I to think that it's about the citizen security that the government you know, does what it does. But it's really to keep the government government, to keep the elites in place. 
to keep the power Mongols in power. This is why they've passed laws that they can go into your homes if they want to. They don't need a warrant. They can take you, can come in right now, throw all of us out, and take over just like that. And all that to me is Nazism. It's no different. Kami Nazi Sharia nonsense is what it is. And uh, well over 500 families just, just in the first part of 20, in the second part of 2013, either that or 2014, I don't remember, 500 families in the United States have, have, have lost their homes this way, documented. And they were ne never went to court, no guilt was ever proven, they weren't even charged with anything. It's the state, folks. Anyone who gets uh, too crazy about, uh, you know, being being a, uh, a patriot, you need to understand what you're, why you're a patriot, and and uh, and who you're, uh, who you're really helping. Do we have a responsibility as 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 uh, people of this land? Of course we do, but the responsibility is in truth, not in the nonsense that we are hearing. The public readings of the law that Joshua did, he did it twice, chapter 24, I mean 23 and 24, recall the elders to leader. What would happen to the United States if people were more or less, our leadership was actually more or less honest? And proved that to us by having, making sure that everyone in the country, about every, uh, every year really would be nice, but let's say every three to five years would rehearse all our rights as citizens of America. Americans, my fellow Americans, <laughs> my fellow Americans, I as your president am proud and pleased to announce to you today and reiterate our great nation's laws. You have a right to private property. You have a right to defend yourself against evildoers. You have a right to be heard in the court of law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What if that was rehearsed every year, every three years? Thus, you see one generation, in other words, the generation that lived after Jefferson, Washington, and those guys, and they weren't Christian, but they, they had their act together as far as if humanity had no sin, these things, these principles would work, but they're only godly principles. They got them from the Bible, even though they weren't Christians, you understand. But a lot of the guys that did sign the Constitution were Christians, okay? So you have a mix. My point is, if the generation after Washington, those guys, would have, it would have been reiterated to them, and it actually in a way was in our school system then, because the Bible was taught. Do you understand? The Bible was taught. But then another generation, and the Bible was less taught, and the Constitution was less brought out to the people. In another generation, it was less still. In another generation, it was less still. To today, nobody knows what's in the Constitution. Therefore, our so-called leaders can abuse it all day long. And now we're to the point where it doesn't matter if we know, it's too late. Well, the same thing is, this is Joshua telling them the same thing. Don't get to a place where it's too late. Don't get to a place when you don't know God or his word. Don't get to a place where you start bowing down to this idol and bowing down to that idol. See, that's really what the message here is. You can't serve God and mammon. You can only serve God. There isn't anything else. There isn't anybody else. I am the Lord. Besides me, there's no God. I know of none. I am the Lord. I am your only Savior. All over the book of Isaiah, hallelujah, and elsewhere. There's only one true living God. His name is Yeshua of Nazareth, the Christ, and who is the living word, the Yeshua Logos, and who, of course, is Jehovah God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All one God. Let's never forget God. And we had to admonish our uh, lovingly, and, and it was well received, and we, we do it a lot, even when we write little notes and stuff. Our uh, 
our still young 18-year-old uh, graduating high school, going into the fashion industry, and she's going to study at a good school for that, as far as that goes, in San Francisco, one of the hubs of New Ageism. San Francisco, Boulder, Colorado, and uh, Virginia. Virginia Beach, Virginia is what it is. That's where Liberty University of all places is, where Tommy Ice taught for years and some of these others. Those three are the three hubs, biggest hubs of New Ageism and all the rest of it in, the, in America. <clears throat> so we all need prayer, certainly all of us who, who have you know, problems, the pregnancy, everything going fine there, and, and uh, my, our, our nephew, Alan, uh, with his uh, brain cancer and others who have issues uh, in your family and your acquaintances, uh, keep praying for that. And one of the outreaches, if you want to call I hate to use that word because it's so perverted, too. I'm having an outreach, you know. I can't take it, okay? But this is personal because I've seen a lot of garbage in that realm. Uh, our conference uh, will have serious messages like it always does. And uh, uh, we haven't actually discussed it with the board, but it uh, came to Jill and my attention that we need to get... Uh, uh, at least one guest from uh, or one of the speakers from the uh, persecuted church who's been nailed to a tree or whatever, who's been shot at, who's been done, you know, because you all testified that went with us, you know, to the meeting. It's a difference. You can read about it, you can watch a video. It's not the same as sitting there, there you are, and you're telling me this stuff. Yeah. And so that, that, that's what we want to do. And uh, We'll work towards that, and we don't know what the finances will be concerning that, but if we all put a few bucks away, you know, a little bit uh, now, within a year's time, we should have enough. And like I said before, and you, none of you have ever left us, let us down, we have always been able to greatly bless our speakers, okay? And I say that in whether they deserve it even or not. Now, everyone we've had, of course they do, but my point is, even if somebody came and didn't necessarily deserve it for, for whatever reason. I just want to make a point. We would still bless them because that's the teaching. That's what we're supposed to, you understand, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we promised somebody uh, $50. We wouldn't take $5 off and only pay them 45 in other words. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying to you? Mm -hmm. So we would give them and bless them some more. So that when they leave, say, I was blessed there. Those people blessed me. They showed the love of God towards me, Okay? And, and that's what we want to do. And so anyway, it's a year away. Uh, keep that in your And I know everybody's got other issues. And uh, understand that. Keep the word before you, please. Even when we're not together on Sundays or the Bible study on Wednesdays. We're going through the book of Revelation. Uh, we'll be uh, finishing the seven churches. Uh, or maybe not finishing, but get further down the road. And, and then it really gets interesting from chapter 4 on forward. Uh, so if you can come to Bible study it's at June, Keith and June's house uh, 6.30 on Wednesdays and it uh, goes to about 8 and we have lively discussions and we talk about other things too and so it's a, it's a good thing let's pray thank you Father in heaven that we belong to you in our true citizenship, and in fact our only citizenship is the one that's with you in heaven. And that you sent us down here on this planet and put us in various places throughout the planet because it all belongs to you. You had a right to do that. So in that sense, we have a right to be wherever we are. No matter what the local so-called authorities think about it or say about it. Thank you for given us your truth which you in fact are and that we will never ever ever lean away to the right or to the left much less turn our back no matter what happens in our lives Lord you already know about it because you know the end from the beginning you already know where each one of us will be tomorrow if one of us stubs our toe tomorrow, you already know it. So let us be 
confident in trusting you in everything we say and do and be the witness that you call us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.